So as, uh, as you would have heard, this is the penultimate week uh, that I am with you. Um, so in case uh, it wasn't clear, we have one more week of this term to go. So we're here next week and then um, I am done forever, um, so to speak. I will expire. So uh, um, I, I, not knowing that uh, I wouldn't be coming back, um, uh, I, we were ending uh, Matthew's, uh, this, the last chunk of Matthew, at chapter 14, which we concluded last week. And I was thinking, oh, we could do with a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks of fill-in at the end of the term. Uh, that's how spiritually I often think about these things, you see. Um, and I thought, oh, I've never, ever gone through the book of Jude. So we could split that in half, that make two weeks. All right, so that's what we're doing. That's the reason. I have to say, once I read this, uh, mainly over the weekend and yesterday, I thought, I wish I'd just done another chapter of Matthew, to be perfectly honest, uh, because it's a bit salacious, and it's quite hostile, really, in the tone of it. Uh, but I, don't, I make no apology for God's word, but it just comes as, with that kind of um, angst about it, as we'll soon uh, hear. So that's the kind of health warning, really, and some of the things that Jude is trying to uh, address um, are a bit uncomfortable, really, but uh, nevertheless, uh, my task is to try and open up God's word, explain what I think it means, and then you need to decide what you want to do with that. If you want to throw things at me, then um, I'll turn the other cheek. Anyway, Jude. So if you've got a Bible, which you're following in, it is page uh, 1231, although the page and the two preceding pages don't have any numbers on them. Uh, so it's, but it is 1231. So if you're anywhere in that region, you'll know we're in the, roughly the right place. The book of Jude, and we're going to read the first 16 verses. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. To those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. It's nice so far, isn't it? All right, that's okay. You can cope with all of that. Dear friends, Although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago has secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave them up to sexual immorality and perversion. They suffer as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Hallelujah, goodness me, right. This is already getting a bit tough, isn't it? Verse 8, in the same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject all authority and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against what they do not understand and what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals. These are the very things that destroy them. You want a new insult for somebody at coffee time? You unreasoning animal. There we are. Um, verse 11. Woe to them. They've taken the way of Cain. They rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves. Clouds without rain they are, blown along by the wind. Autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame. Wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, 
the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. This is not one of those afternoons where you say, this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we always want to be people who allow your word to read us. Help us, therefore, to come to this uh, with humility and openness. But help us, too, through some harsh rhetoric, to hear your voice of grace that beckons us closer and points us always to Jesus, who is the Lord of all. For we pray in his name. Amen. So, <clears throat> uh, Tom Wright, who's the former Bishop of Durham, uh, if he's writing uh, any academic work, he goes by the name N.T. Wright, sounds posher and, uh, and more clever. He was writing about this uh, letter, uh, which I read this morning, and he likened it to kind of 1920s and 1930s Europe. Um, there was obviously the rising threat of fascism in Germany and the horrors of uh, a Nazi government. And there were some, if you know your history, who were warning about this and warning about how bad things could get if uh, uh, people didn't take notice of Hitler. But a good number of people, uh, learned and wise people, uh, throughout Europe felt, oh, it can't be quite as bad as you say it is. Sure, it will all be all right. Um, and of course, sadly, only after the event in the mid to late 1940s did we begin to realise uh, to the horror of the world that actually the exploits of Nazi Germany were even worse than anyone could have imagined. We've all seen the uh, videos taken the liberation of uh, Auschwitz or uh, other places. Jude is warning uh, about how bad things can get. And it may well be that we think he's being rather hysterical. He's certainly used to using Greek rhetoric and he certainly likes to kind of build his argument with fervour. There's no doubt about that. Maybe there's some hyperbole here as well. He's wanting to grab people's attention. He is wanting to sound a warning. Things could get very bad. And he wants people to wake up and to understand the perils of being led astray from the faith. Because for Jude... Uh, as for the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, uh, a little bit of falsehood, when it takes root in the life of the church, can infect the whole. It's like leaven in the lump. It kind of gets everywhere. And Jude is most likely the brother of James, verse 1. We read that. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, James, read Galatians 1, uh, 19. James refers to himself as the Lord's brother. We'll be preaching on Sunday night from Mark chapter 6, verse 3, where Jesus is getting a, uh, Mark chapter 6, 1 to 13, verse 3 of that passage, Jesus getting a hostile reputation and uh, his brothers are around. Uh, and uh, we think that Jude is related to James. James is the brother of Jesus. And of course, by the time Jude is writing, James is one of the prominent leaders in the Jewish church. Um, he's a, an important person, Acts at chapter 15 is a big meeting, the Council of Jerusalem, and James is, is uh, one of the key 
players in this. He's a formative leader uh, in the early church. So no wonder Jude uh, uses him as a reference point to identify himself. I'm James's brother, probably the half-brother of Jesus. But more than that, he is a, a servant of Christ, verse 1. So he's wanting to make clear with all the apostol- apostolic letters that they don't speak of their own authority. They haven't thought, OK, I'm going to write what I want to think. Uh, I'm not a private individual, but I'm speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and at the behest of Jesus Christ. He's representing uh, the voice of Jesus, as all the apostles claim. That's part of their uh, unique claim to authority. And Jude prays, firstly, that, uh, that those that receive this letter would uh, receive um, or would rather enjoy all the benefits of belonging to Christ. To those who are called, you know, we might use the word chosen there. God has purposely brought to himself those that belong to him. I mean, you know, I'm an Arminian the- theologian, if that matters to you. I'm more Arminian than Calvinist. If that means nothing to you, please don't worry about it, all right? But what I mean is I think we do have some agency and some free choice as to whether we respond to God or not. We're not just robots who are predetermined to respond to God, and some have that predetermined nature in them and others do not. I don't believe that's not the Wesleyan tradition. It's not what Mr. Wesley believed. It's not what the Bible says. And more importantly, it's not what Paul Smith thinks either. Uh, um, we are, but, but despite the fact that I think we have got free choice as to whether we respond to the grace of God, I do believe that those who are in Christ have been chosen, called, brought together by God. It's not one or the other. It's both and. Jude says you are called by God, you're beloved in God. We're not called by some abstract being, but one who loves us with an everlasting love. And then we are kept for Jesus Christ. We're to keep, uh, God will do all that God needs to do to keep us in Christ forever. When we get to the end of the letter, verse 21, uh, we see, and from other places in uh, the Apostle Paul's teaching, that we've got some responsibility too to keep up our end of the bargain. We need to continue to walk faithfully and blamelessly before God. But as much as God's commitment to us is uh, enduring, uh, we are, as much as it depends upon him, we are kept forever in Jesus Christ. Jude wants to celebrate the wonders of the Christian faith and the benefits of salvation. That's what he wants to do. And I have to say, as a Bible teacher and a preacher, that's, you know, that's where I'd want to major on my time. Uh, I want to teach people the wonders of belonging to Jesus Christ, the great tidings of salvation. That's the thing that that matters to me. That's what I uh, love to tell people about. That's where I'd love to spend all my time. But Jude has had to send, uh, set aside uh, a lot of what he wanted to do because there's an altogether different message that was getting uh, into the life of the church, the overseas. And he needs to address it for their benefit. Um, no wonder Jude speaks about people being kept safe, as it were, in Jesus because they are under threat. The enemy will always seek to undermine the gospel and use different means to do so. And that is happening here as well. That's why uh, the hearers of Jude are to contend for the faith. Verse three, Uh, it's a uh, when you talk about contending, it's the same word that you might uh, train for an uh, an athletic, um, uh, you know, train for the Olympics or train for a, uh, uh, a race or get yourself into shape. You actually have to put some effort in. You have to kind of fight your, your flesh, the bit of you that wants to stay at home and, and you know, eat hot chocolate, and, no, eat chocolate and drink cups of tea. Uh, you know, you need to fight that bit off and, and try and uh, get in touch with a bit of your body that wants to get out and get active and get some exercise. There's a sense of wrestling with ourselves to get ourselves ready uh, for a task. That's what Jude means when he says contend. What are we to contend for? We're to contend for the faith. Uh, And when he says the faith, he means the body of beliefs and understandings that make up the the Christian teaching. Uh, The Greek word for that is the kerygma, the essential basis of the Christian faith. That Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. 
And so Judas is saying, right, we need to contend for those things. You need to fight to preserve them. Well, why do you need to fight to preserve them? Isn't this a, a Christian community? Aren't they all on the same page? Well, sadly, evidently not. Verse 4, certain people. You can hear it said in committee meetings, can't you? <laughs> uh, I'm for this. I'm, 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 I'm all in favour, Mr Chairman. But certain people in this room are not. You know, it's a kind of the sideways glance. Certain people. Who are these certain people? They are, says Jude, in summary, false teachers. And the principal charge, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't hold back on his language. The principal charge is that they pervert the grace of God. Really what he means is they cheapen the grace of God. They, they misapply it. In essence, what, uh, the, the main charge against these false teachers, um, there's some more colourful stuff we'll get to in a minute, but the main charge against them is that they were uh, sowing a message within the church, if we've been forgiven, we can do what we want. We've got no responsibility. It's a cheapening of the grace of God. That's been a heresy in the church since the first century called antinomianism. The sense that because we're forgiven, oh, we'll do what we want because we're, you know, we're saved, etc. I had somebody in my, my church who used to be like that. He said, don't worry, Gareth, I'm going to heaven. It doesn't matter what I do now. And he believed it. Bless him. I hope by God's grace he is there. Really, I do. Sure he was. But he seemed to completely misunderstand the Christian faith. He had this kind of transactional element to it. I've kind of... Forgive the, the, the crass language. It was as though he'd kind of got his ticket in as long as he kind of kept that securely in his back pocket. It didn't matter what he did otherwise. Well, that is not the teaching of the New Testament. See, you know, if you look on the Methodist Church website today, you will see front and centre on the Methodist Church website, God loves you, no strings attached. That is the good news. Um, and I want to say... No, it isn't, actually. That's half of the good news. It's a very important half. I am thrilled and delighted that the God who created all there is uh, would invest in me and you and everyone that has ever lived, whoever they are, whatever background, perspective, uh, creed or race they come from, they have inherent value because they are loved by a God who creates. We should never lose sight of that. We should never... Um, you know, Charles Wesley called it amazing love because it is amazing. We should never kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, standard love. You know? It's incredible that God would choose to love us as we are. And he does. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more and nothing we can do to make him love us less. True. But that's only half of the New Testament message about Jesus Christ. Uh, God loves us with an everlasting love. He has proved that in giving his son to die on a cross so that we might repent, turn from our self-centred orientation and live for Christ to the glory of God. It is in Christ that transformation occurs. It is in Christ that we become a new creation. What does Paul say? The old has gone. The new has come. We are not and never should be the same. And this is exactly what Jude is wanting to, to get to. He's saying we have a responsibility to respond to the love of God, mind-blowing love of God in Christ, by submitting to the work of the Spirit and being transformed in our inner being. So that as we've said when we've talked about fruitfulness or sanctification, as the days go on and the years go on, we reflect more and more of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It is because we have been forgiven and set free that we seek in response to God's wonderful loving kindness to reflect the glory and honour of God as our joy and our delight as an expression of gratitude to him. And also we want to be channels of, verse 2, mercy, peace and love to other people, do we not? 
Well, maybe we don't, but we do. <laughs> Trust me, we do. Mm-hmm. So now Jude goes on and he really starts to kind of get on his um, soapbox. You know, I was going to, um, yeah, um, anyway. Uh, high horse. High horse, that was it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, was, I just got a mental blank. And I was about to say he gets on his horse, but that didn't really make any sense. Uh, I don't think he did get on a horse. But anyway, who knows? He may have done. Anyway, and what he's doing is he's drawing, verse 5, 6, 7, he's drawing from images from Israel's history. Firstly, verse 5, God had delivered people from slavery across the Red Sea. The people of God had had come uh, uh, out of Egypt. But we know that because of the rebellion of that generation that escaped from Egypt, they did not set foot in the promised land. So God saved, yet people uh, rebelled. Just because people have been delivered by the grace of God, you should not presume on God's grace and mercy in a complacent way. That's what he's saying. Now, verse 6, this is all gets very bizarre and very strange now. I did give you a health warning to start with. So there was a, a, a mainstream thought in Jewish tradition, which was going on and, and very much evident at the time of Jesus uh, and the New Testament writers, that a root of lots of the evil in the world was uh, due to a group of fallen angels that had left heaven, come down to earth, and started to have sexual relationships with the women uh, in the time of Noah. So back that, we get the, the root of that is in Genesis 6, 1 to 4. Now we think that they, were, they misunderstood what that passage is about. But there was a, a strong tradition in Judaism, uh, first century Judaism at this point, that, that, uh, that felt that was the case. And that was elaborated in a very bizarre book called One Enoch, It was kind of a well-known piece of Jewish writing, a bit like Shakespeare would be well-known English writing now. We might say it's good writing. People might study it. Well, people were familiar with one Enoch. Um, It wasn't recognised as authoritative by anybody, but it was in um, it it was in very much in the minds of the first century. And uh, and Jude is saying, well, think about those angels that acted inappropriately. And he's linking them to these false teachers. And he's saying, those people are going to face a a similar fate to that of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know that in the tradition of the faith, Sodom and Gomorrah has been used as a warning against homosexual practice. But again, having said what I just said about Genesis 6, in verse 6, it is quite possible then that actually what Jude is wanting to condemn is the, uh, the, the original sin in Genesis 6, which was the common belief at the time that people had had sexual relations with angels. I mean, it, it, your mind just spins, doesn't it? But anyway, um, so we're not clear what Jude is referring to here. That, that we, We're not clear, and scholars disagree. The point is that Jude is comparing the sins of these false teachers to the people of Israel, to the fallen angels, and to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's using those as illustrations. He's, he's not saying that their sin is the same, but he's trying to say that people that, that uh, misappropriate the faith or lead people astray uh, are doing something very serious and require um, a judgment as serious as that which others deserve in the past. Does so that make some sense? That's what he's trying to, to say. And he's pointing to Jewish history and he's uh, appealing to these hearers to consider the errors of the past, lest they don't mess up again. And I, you know, I wonder whether, uh, um, I, I mean this with no sense of uh, rudeness or flippancy at all, but I wonder whether some of you older in years than I, I wonder whether you just roll your eyes in despair as you watch, you know, every 20 years or so, humanity seems to repeat the same cycle of mistakes. We see it in our politics, I'm not going to get partisan about that, we see it in warfare, don't we? We mustn't let this happen again. We have a peacekeeping force here. 20 years goes by, oh, there's another war over here. You know? and, um, and, and we are so slow to learn these lessons. And I sometimes think, have people not read their history books? <laughs> they don't see how this stuff happens. And um, people are saying, aren't they, there's echoes of, of uh, you know, Putin's aggression now with some of the things that we saw in the last century. Please, Lord, let that not be so. Please, Lord, let that not be so. But you think, have we not learnt? (laughs) Some of this stuff looks familiar. Jude is saying, 
Have you not learned, people that are reading my letter? Have you not seen the issues they got into in the past and you're just doing them again? He goes on, verse 9, and he's getting now to uh, some ancient uh, sources that are uh, discussing uh, the archangel Michael. He's referring to a, a quite an obscure biblical reference in Zechariah 3, uh, where there's this quite bizarre reference to uh, Michael uh, having a kind of a conversation with Satan. And Michael, instead of rebuking Satan directly, uh, Michael sort of says it's for the Lord to, re- to rebuke uh, Satan. Again, it's very bizarre. We don't really see Michael appearing in the New Testament apart from in Revelation. Uh, somewhat strange. The point that Jude is trying to make that is uh, behind all this is that once you, you, you so even even Michael the archangel didn't transgress his authority. He let the Lord judge Satan. That's the point. That's what Jude's trying to say. Once you reject supernatural authority, once you think of yourself more highly than you ought. Once you think that we are the centre of our decision making and it's what we want above anything else, we're in to trouble. It's very easy once you reject, reject supernatural authority to then start rejecting human authority as well. And Jude thinks that the rejection of those things leads to licentiousness and he's worried that when we therefore regard all sorts of frameworks and uh, rules for conduct we retreat into our base desires of human beings and Jude is worried that the root of that is sexual malpractice now the, then these false teachers he's still on his tirade about false teachers by the way that's this is all he's doing this is one big sort of like think, Jude take a breath man take a breath but anyway he's then continues with this uh, verse 11 woe to them they walked in the way of Cain. They abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to the error of Balaam. They perished in Korah's rebellion. So, again, echoes from various people in Jewish history. What was Cain? He was a murderer. Murdered his brother. What was Balaam? Although he didn't follow through on it, he was to take money to curse God's people. Korah was a leader of a, a, a rebellion. If you read uh, the book of Numbers, you'll uh, see uh, uh, the sedition that Korah attempted. So Jude is saying these false teachers, they're as bad as a murderer, some who it takes money uh, for spiritual cursing, uh, and as bad as somebody who's rebelling against God. This is the case he's building. These false teachers, he thinks, they can promise much, but they actually can't deliver. They're like a cloud that looks full of rain but actually no comes out of it. They're like a tree that should bud uh, full of, uh, of leaves or fruit in the autumn harvest time, but it, nothing grows on it. They're like uh, shepherds who should have food for the sheep, but actually all they do is eat themselves. They're like uh, uh, clouds swept over by the wind. They're gone before they can deliver what they promised. And then he goes into some even more strange quotes about one Enoch. And uh, there is a whole kind of whole school of uh, biblical theology which argues about whether we should consider one Enoch as scripture because Jude quotes from it. Some people have made a career out of that. Um, I wouldn't worry too much. As I said... Uh, you know, if, if we were to quote Shakespeare in a church service, does it mean I think Shakespeare is the same in the Bible? No, of course not. But uh, you might draw on it to illustrate a point. In the same way, you might quote C.S. Lewis or, or Tolkien or, you know, the great Paul Smith or whatever. You know, you, you might... I've only got two weeks left of this. So, uh, uh, you know, you, you might well quote something that is well known. You're not saying that it's on the same as Scripture, but you draw on it because it uh, has sort of common authority in the knowledge of the people uh, to build an argument. So Jude is doing that. And he's again just continuing and continuing, continuing on this way. He's talking about ungodly people. He uses the word ungodly four times uh, in verse 15 and 16. 
Um, and he's trying to say that the people, therefore, that are out to, to, to pervert, to misapply the message of the gospel have got one thing really in mind. And it's their own reputation. It's their own wealth. They're looking for money. It's their own fame. They are loud-mouthed boasters. That's a second insult you could throw around at coffee time, you know. <laughs> you loud-mouthed boaster. You unreasoning animal. You know, anyway, people wonder what's going on. You can say, oh, we're just quoting the scriptures. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that sense of people being puffed up, they just are in it for themselves and for their own attention. Those are not people that are seeking to build up the church of Jesus Christ and to build up the people of God in the most holy faith. And it's vital, says Jude, let's go right back to the beginning. It is vital then that the people of God contend for that which is true. That they, they wrestle and struggle to uphold that which is true for a little bit astray you just tilt the dial a little bit and suddenly you can veer hugely off course Jude is worried about this he's worried about the influence of such false teachers and he's concerned for the life and witness of the church and so may God give us that same zeal and same love for the Lord's people, uh, even if perhaps we may be able to use a little less rhetoric uh, than Jude does. Let's pray together. And Father, we uh, thank you that we are called, beloved, and kept in Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you that none of that is our own doing, but is all of your grace and mercy, which you have made known to us in Jesus Christ. Would you fill us with a love for him, a love for his ways, and a love for his word? that we might have the, the zeal of Jude to contend for the faith and to do so full of mercy, grace and love, those very things which he wishes that we may receive and channel to others. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.